what I'm going to do now is actually something that is to do with meteorological issues. I'm going to talk about climate change. And what I want to do is to ask you to come back with suggestions, ideas. So it's rather, you know, this uh, don't ask what, you, what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So I'm asking not what I can do for you, but asking you to do something for me, getting back with uh, ideas, comments, etc., towards the end. Um, what I'm going to do first is, um, let's see here, talk about how we have increased focus, we need to have increased focus on adaptation to climate change. I'm going to talk about um, why climate change is more relevant to developed countries than to non-developing countries. And I'm going to talk about three fields where, to my mind, climate change is going to be particularly relevant or severe, if you might uh, put it like that. Um, so, and when we've gone through these three areas, I'd like to open the debate. Um, comments. Right. Um, this is really old-fashioned, isn't it? <laughs> now, the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that was signed back in 92. And at that time, we talked about mitigation. And what is mitigation? Mitigation means that you cut down emissions of greenhouse gases. And why do you do that? That's because, at least some of us believe, that climate change is man-made. That man, we, are at least part of the cause to the climate change, to the global warming. So that was clearly the objective back in the early 90s, and that continued like that for, for quite a number of years. However, Going up to 2001, another issue came not to the fore, still is not, but came on the table at least, adaptation. And what's the difference? Adaptation, that's when we have a situation where we are going to have climate change, we are going to have the trouble, we are going to have the problems, and we need to cope with these. Um, and then, Especially only in 2013, and also, we saw that the UNFCCC took on what I refer to as damage. It's called loss and damage. And what's that? Loss and damage, that's when mitigation is not the solution. That's when adaptation is not the solution. That's when we have the problem and we cannot do anything about it. Radicial harm, uh, we call it also. That's, for instance, if you are a Pacific island and you're going to be flooded. Mitigation, adaptation, that's not a solution. So if we put these together, what do we have? We have mad. And that is the problem, that if we go to the damage situation, we have the problem and we're not going to lose, solve the problem. We're going to, to live with the problems in a way that is not adapting, it's, it's not getting away with it. Uh, we have to go through it. And that's where we really have arrived now in quite a number of situations. So we need to stop this before things go mad. Some of you might know this book by Giddens, Anthony Giddens. It's The Politics of Climate Change. And on page two, he makes what he defines, what he refers to as the Giddens Paradox. Uh, I quite like this, that you name a paradox after yourself. Um, the basic thing he says, he points out, is that um, I'll try to, to just take the first part of this quote, not the full part. Since the dangers posed by global warming aren't tangible, immediate, or visible in the course of day-to-day -day life, many will sit on their hands, do nothing of a concrete nature about them. And then he goes on to say that the problem is that we only act when these dangers, when the problems are irrefutable, when we could do nothing about them. That's the Giddens paradox. Um, my point now is to say that this is not even correct. We have to go even further. Because if you want to read a very interesting book, very well written, um, I know Peter Watts, it's not only because I want to sell his book, um, as he says, sell, 
himself. This is also very cheap. It's made by one of the Penguin Presses. This is called A Farewell to Eyes. And what Peter Wadhams does is that he shows that these changes, they are happening at the moment to an extent that is very hard to believe. It's not something future, as the one Giddens is talking about. It's something happening, and it's actually affecting our day-to-day -day lives. We just don't think about it, not to the extent we need to. We also can see that, for instance, the World Meteorological Organization, they pointed out that last year, 2015, was the first year that they believe that we had a temperature rise, global warming, of one degree Celsius, which would be pre-industrial times. And that's quite a lot. We can also look to the World Bank. The World Bank asked the Potsdam Institute, High Quality Institute, on trying to establish, trying to analyze what are the likely consequences. First, if we do nothing, if we have the assumed four degrees Celsius temperature rise by the end of this century. That's the first report coming out, I think, in 2012. Try and read it, and you can't sleep afterwards. It's not nice reading. And what they really point out, the, the bottom line is, we really can't say what's happening, because it's so complex and it's so bad that this is not really possible to, 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 to try to, to say. But they also had two other reports looking at different parts of the world. First of all, Global South. And these two reports are, what if we actually manage to do something? What about the, the temperature rise, the global warming, that's locked into the system that we cannot avoid unless we start trying to take out some of the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere? That's not nice reading either. And part of that is what we see today. So we have some institutions that I'll put it like this, that the Republicans, even, in the US, would normally not see as the enemies, the bad guys. And they also point out that there might actually be some problems we are faced with, and we cannot avoid that. So why do we not react? I personally believe that there are really two main reasons. One is that we are talking about climate change. That's a, what we also refer to as a slow onset disaster. It's, it's happening slowly. It's not like an earthquake. It's not like a cyclone or anything like that. It's just making the, the, the water comes down a bit more. It's going to be a bit warmer, and then a bit more, and a bit more, one way or the other. So it, it takes time. And we, well, we try to adapt. Not everybody can adapt, especially if, you, if your island is submerged in water. But it's difficult to act, react. It's difficult to see that this is really it. Back in Copenhagen, we're talking about that this has been a fantastic September. It's been the summer we had in September. Is that due to climate change? Perhaps, perhaps not. But it was gorgeous, honestly. Um, another thing is this, we're talking about a common good. And if someone sits on his or her hands, then the others just have to react more, do more to, to counter the problem. So we need to do something. And I'd say that the more I look into this topic, um, the more worried I, I become, um, unfortunately. And that's why I need your help. Right. So we need to look more on adaptation. We are going to have climate change. It is here. It's part of everyday life. It's going to be worth. We can't stop it from happening. We can try to mitigate, but we still need adaptation. That's the first part. The second thing to make an observation on is that this is, first of all, something that is going to affect the global south. It's also going to happen in Helsinki. We are going to see differences, but, but the main problems are going to be felt in the global south. And there really are two reasons for that. One, I'll refer back to what Peter said. Peter defined risk. And what he really showed was that when you have a risk, you're also looking at the vulnerability of a society. So that's the same when we're, talking, when we're talking about a disaster. A disaster basically is a very appreciable negative impact on the order of a society. And if you have a society that can cope with an earthquake, can cope with uh, climate change, then it's not going to turn into a disaster. But if you cannot do that, if you're not able to cope, 
then it becomes a disaster. So disaster is not defined by what is actually striking you. It's not the earthquake itself. As Peter said, it could happen in Attica, and no one, well, we'll notice because someone in the meteorological offices or, or elsewhere will tell us there was an, an earthquake, but we will not know. But it's very different if it happens in Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Then things are completely different. But again, it might also be different if the same type of earthquake happens in Tokyo, and you'll just see that the buildings are swaying one side to the other and people are working on an hour later. So it, it really is important that societies can cope with these strikes, including, obviously, climate change. And that means that the poorer society is, the less likely it is to be able to cope. That's one reason. But the other reason also is that, that if we go to the global south, that's where the actual effects, the climatic effects are going to be more drastic. Droughts, for instance. But also one thing that, that has surprised me, that is when we're talking about sea level rise, for some reason I thought the sea level rise was going to happen all over the globe at the same level. But sea level rise is going to be more severe, more pronounced where the water is warm, which happened to be close to the equator, and less pronounced where it's cold, when we're going to be closer to the poles. So again, there are going to be differences and again, referring back to, to, to Peter's presentation earlier today, flooding, when we have sea level rise, one of the really bad things about sea level rise as compared to a flood, a river, sorry, flooding, that would be that the sea is salty. We have salt water entering the rivers, entering uh, the, the, the deltas, and in itself causing um, harm in this way. So, First, adaptation is needed, and we're going to see these problems happening, particularly in developed countries. Right. Then the third part. Where, from a societal point of view, I believe that there would be three areas where we particularly need to, to focus our attention when we're looking at what are the consequences of climate change of global warming. The first would be migration, that climate change will lead to increased migration. The second would be public health, that we'll have public health challenges caused by the global warming, or at least related to global warming. And the third one, where we'll really like to see challenges, would be food production in a broad sense. Perhaps before going into these, um, when we're talking about this, I don't believe that we should just say that this is, that climate change causes migration. Unless your island is flooded, submerged, then it's a combination of factors that we normally see. Climate change will be a multiplier to what else could happen. We heard earlier today a question on, um, on Syria where some argue that the, the war we see today in Syria is basically caused by climate change. My personal view is that climate change might have been a multiplier to other factors. And as some of you might know, in 2014, Pentagon, the Minister of Defense of the US, came out with a, small, a short report and they argued that climate change, that is a threat multiplier. I think that's a very succinct, a very correct way of viewing climate change. Climate change is not in itself, in most cases, producing the effects. It's just making things worse. And that's for that reason that we need to, to address it. Um, when we look at migration, we are likely to see that in some cases people are forced to, to flee. Again, the Pacific is probably the most obvious place to, to look to. However, in most situations, climate change will just be one component that is pushing people away. If you look to Sub-Saharan Africa, we know that the predictions say that we're going to have a very, very significant increase in population size. And that means that there'll be most likely more migration. 
Migration in its own is not a bad thing. Migration is a very good way of coping with, with problems or trying to find a better place to live. But if people are migrating, we still need to take care of their rights. And, and as a lawyer, I believe that especially when we're looking at people who are forced to migrate due to climate change, we need to consider their rights. As some of you might know, we have so far not accepted, we being the international community, the, the idea of climate refugees. That climate cannot be a reason for having a refugee status. And that means that the receiving country does not have an obligation to take in a person who is fleeing due to climate change. I personally believe that if we're talking about forced migration due to climate change, then we need to reconsider that situation. But what about those, the very many people who are going to migrate due to many reasons, including climate change, that the droughts are coming, becoming more severe, they're going to be more frequent in the area they live. At the same time, the population growth, they need to move on. How do we handle these? We're talking about humans, human beings, so we still need to consider what rights should we give these people, how are we handling them in a in my view, in an ethical, correct way. That's the first area that, where we need to find solutions. The second one is public health. And we might see in the future that with the changing climate, with the global warming, we'll see new ways that diseases will spread, new areas where they, they will arrive. Um, there might actually be very, one very positive side effect to this, and that is that, for instance, if you look to Copenhagen, we've got a new mosquito. The mosquito that is able to spread the Nile fever. And what does that mean? That means that now, in the future, if we're going to have Nile fever all through Europe, there'll probably be some businesses, some medical companies, that find it attractive to try to find ways of combating that. So, so there is a side effect that is positive, namely that the global north, having also the, what we otherwise would call tropical diseases, there'll also be a market to actually try to, 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 to go against these diseases. But that's probably a very small thing compared to the big picture that we're going to, to, to see. Um, and again, climate change is going to be one factor and amongst others, one of the other factors that we are seeing at the moment is that multi-resistance amongst various bacteria is increasing dramatically. That the antibiotics that we normally use do not work anymore. That's again also going to be a problem in the global north. But in any event, that is going to be combined with the spread of the diseases due to climate change, due to global warming, we're going to see a different scenario and that's not going to be a positive one, a pleasant one. When we're talking about epidemics also, one thing we can tell, for instance, from the Ebola crisis we have seen in West Africa, is that what really matters when we want to, to handle these situations, that's governance. That's how effective, how good the, the authorities, first of all, are at you know, encapsulating, keeping within a certain area uh, the epidemics. And we're going to, to, to face up to that uh, in the future again. We have had that earlier. We're seeing that probably more often due to, amongst other things, climate change. So we need to think about how can we as societies, how can we address these challenges in the public health field? Right. Lastly, food production. Peter has shown us that droughts are going to, are happening. Not so much more frequent as I'd expected, uh, according to the data. That didn't go well with what I'm going to say. But at least we're going to see a changed precipitation pattern uh, around the world. This meaning that when we're going to have it dry, it's going to be dry in the future. And when it's going to be wet, it's going to be better. So things are going to be more extreme when we're talking about climate change. We're seeing more extreme, according to the predictions at least, cyclones, not least in, in, uh, in the Southeast Asia, we're going to see that these more extreme weather events are going to harm the infrastructure, 
meaning that it might be more difficult to bring out our uh, food from one place to another. So we're going to see consequences on food production. At the same time, according to the FAO, the Food uh, and Cultural Organization of the UN, today, if you look at food production and look at food pr consumption, one third of all food produced in this world never ends up as food in the mouth of a human being. So one of the, the challenges that we are faced with, even without climate change, to my mind is to actually get the food from the fields and into the, uh, to the mouth of, of, of those who, who suffer in one way or the other. Another factor that we also have to remember is that most famines, they happen in areas, or arguably happen in areas, where there, there actually is food. Um, I guess the most famous one is the Irish potato crisis back in um, something like 1845 to 1814, 1849, where you had people dying literally in Ireland, whilst the Irish, they exported food to the British to an extent that would have been able to actually cover the food uh, requirements during the, the, the famine. So we, we have two challenges uh, here. One is actually to get the food to people, not seeing it um, lost on the way, one way or the other. And the other one is actually to ensuring that when we have the food, also give it to those who are in need. Um, which basically, the la last part is something of, just as lawyers say, that's the right to food. Right. Um, when we're talking about food production, what we're really talking about is technical issues. How do we get the food in a way to the consumer that is still eatable? And when we're talking about right to food, that is more political uh, um, an issue for the politicians rather than for, for us as social science uh, people. But I still believe that, that the implementation of these ideas, the way we actually go about putting that into the societies, that is a task for us as researchers, social science researchers, those of us who, who actually believe that we are doing social science research at least. So, right. I've now tried to, to, to very briefly, see time-wise, um, go through these three topics, uh, three sub-areas. Um, and the idea now is to hope to have feedback from you as to what is it that we should do? How can we actually go about doing this as in the social sciences, trying to address these challenges that are not a challenge of the future? It's not just about mitigating the emission of greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases. It's also about adapting our societies to take into account these challenges that are locked into the system, the climate changes that we cannot avoid. Right, so thank you.